بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا المرسلين وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين um, السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته Dear brothers and sisters, today we will be talking about how to nourish your gut um, Without further ado, I hope this will give you some creative tips on how to introduce a wider variety of um, healthy and nutritious foods to really support your gut health All right, so um, here are some, on the first slide, I'd like to just take you through some key principles for gut health. So my aim with these um, shorter clips is really to give you some bullet points rather than a lot of scientific detail. Um, the first thing is that um, Ramadan fasting is a continuation of, uh, you know, the intermittent fasting that we do throughout the year, the Sunnah fast on Monday, Thursday, the white day fasts. We know that um, time, there's a lot of evidence now behind time-restricted e eating, which basically means you consume all your meals within um, less than a 12-hour window. So that might be 12 hours, 10 hours, 8 hours, or even 6 hours. Um, people that consume their meals within a 10-hour window typically have 20% uh, less calorie intake, so it can be helpful with weight loss. However, it also carries all the additional benefits of uh, what we would call the intermittent fasting. So, um, you know, things like resetting metabolism, helping with weight loss, regulating blood sugar, regulating cholesterol, all those things. In addition, there have been some studies around people who typically eat when they should not be eating. Remember, our bodies have a circadian rhythm, so they might be eating, for example, they've had their dinner and they're just eating late at night for some additional reason or they are eating late meals um, and this is outside of Ramadan that there has been some um, tentative evidence that this may be associated with increased risk of heart disease and mortality as well as being linked with weight gain and um, you know eating disorders so from that point of view um, although in Ramadan we switch around our eating hours we also switch around our routine we do start our day with a suhoor um, and perhaps in the shorter days, we do also actually have most of our meals in normal hours, but we skip most of the day. Um, essentially, we are giving the gut a rest, which is very important, very restorative for it. Um, next thing is that, you know, we have to remember this is not just all about a balanced diet, but it's about a balanced lifestyle. So that's looking at a combination of uh, stress, social relationships, sleep, toxins, environment, um, exercise, rest, and not just our food. And often, you know, we go very heavy on the food, but that's just one part of the puzzle. Um, and our Dean teaches us to be Ummad and Wasalba. So we are balanced Ummah, and the greatest example of balance is in the life of the Prophet. Number three is avoiding inflammation. All those triggers that put up our stress levels cause inflammation in the gut. All those toxins, all those foreign substances, food like substances, um, deep fried foods, many of those things. Um, they, they generate toxic chemicals inside our gut. Um, and then, you know, so it's avoiding those and introducing antioxidants, so brightly coloured fruits and vegetables um, and anti-inflammatory foods, which we'll talk about in a little bit. And then introducing food for the gut bacteria, so prebiotics and probiotics. So you are what you eat. Um, Dr. Mark Hyman, who is one of the acclaimed um, physicians in the functional health movement, has said the health of your gut determines what nutrients are absorbed and what toxins, allergens and microbes are kept out and therefore it is directly linked to the health of the total organism. Um, so you are essentially, you are what you eat and we often think of the gut as an internal organ, we don't really think about what we're exposing it to. However, our gut is our essential um, inside-outside link, the link between the outside world and our inside world and is where we have the biggest interface with the outside world and with the blood where, you know, um, and our tissues where all the absorption happens across the gut wall. So it's very, very important to preserve the integrity of that gut wall, but also to limit toxins and nasty microbes and other things, um, you know, unnatural things that, are, that may be causing harm to our health. Um, regarding food and inflammation, just a few, uh, just the famous hadith of Al-Miqdam ibn Ma'adi Qareeb, he reported 
for the Allah. And the, the Prophet ﷺ said, The son of Adam does not fill any vessel worse than his stomach. It is enough for the son of Adam to eat a few mouthfuls to straighten his back. But he must, if he must fill his stomach, then a third for his food, a third for his drink, and a third for air. So I think the reason I brought this uh, particular hadith in is because it talks about moderation. But it's also coming back to this idea of time-restricted eating in the sense that if we're grazing all the time, that's a constant inflammatory stress on the gut. Um, and it actually needs a break from eating um, just to service itself and to service our bodies. And so all things in moderation, um, no oversized meals and no eating around the clock. Um, all the, both of these things are quite stressful for the human body and for the gut. Um, we mentioned earlier about pro-inflammatory foods. These would include things like deep fried foods, ultra processed foods, so things like, you know, that, that are unrecognisable in nature. For example, rice krispies or blown up bits of rice that have got nothing to do with what rice would look like in, in the real world. Um, you know, cornflakes. Many cereals are ultra processed. There are also, of course, many, many other foods which you know you would never be able to recreate quite in your kitchen or ingredients that you can't read. Um, so all these things are really essentially ultra processed. Another red flag to look out for are processed foods with more than five ingredients. And foods high in sugar, especially the combined with fats, that's quite a toxic combination. Um, dairy and gluten are disputable and they develop, depend on the actual individual. Not all individuals are sensitive to dairy or to gluten. But if you are going to go for dairy, go for organic or raw dairy preferably where the animals have been treated well and been grazed on um, in a sustainable way on green pastures. Um, and with gluten, now is probably not the time to start experimenting. Um, but you would know if you were to remove gluten from your diet, from your diet whether it was causing you any problems. Um, so you, these are the foods you want to avoid. And then you've got your anti-inflammatory foods, so things you do want to put into your gut to support its health and its integrity would be eating the rainbow so foods and fruits at least try and go for 30 different varieties that might be different colors different shades different um you know breeds of your favorite fruits and vegetables nuts and seeds and even grains um and especially greens and berries these are particularly high in antioxidants that fight toxic and uh, oxidative stress so um, basically inflammation in the gut. There are also foods like healthy fats, so things like butyrate and key and omega-3 fats, these are healthy fats and these can help um, really support gut health, they can seal up a leaky gut, they can support brain health um, and heart health. What is the gut microbiome? Well, if I told you you were more bacteria than human, you'd probably raise some eyebrows at me. But in fact, we are probably outnumbered um, by 10 to 1, at least inside the human gut. Um, we have trillions of microorganisms, bacteria, viruses, fungi, um, and other life forms. And we are still learning about many of these life forms, uh, many of the species and strains and what their roles are. And the chances are we'll probably never be able to encompass them in our knowledge um, because there are so many um, to understand not just about the individual function, but about how they collaborate to support our health. And this is why when we introduce um, particular strains of bacteria, we don't really know the impact that they will have. When you introduce a probiotic food, you don't really know what impact it's going to have until you try it. Um, there are several diseases thought to be influenced by processes in the gut microbiome. These include things like cancer, inflammatory conditions such as inflammatory bowel disease, autoimmune conditions such as multiple sclerosis and autistic spectrum disorder. And I'm sure almost every, you know, many, many conditions will be linked because, um, you know, gut microbes are involved also in the production of nutrition, fighting inflammation um, and many chemical reactions. The gut microbiome also strongly interacts with certain drugs. So for example, um, antibiotics will wipe out a lot of good bacteria. It may take a while to recover those bacteria. Um, they also react with uh, drugs like ibuprofen. So you should take them only if you need to because otherwise they will be eradicating some of your healthy gut bacteria. On this note, um, fecal microbial transplants, which is where they have um, purified bacterial samples from stools of healthy individuals, may help to um, achieve remission or improve the quality of life of people with certain conditions such as inflammatory bowel disease and autistic spectrum disorders 
where they're found to have a narrow range of gut bacteria or certain particular strains appear to be missing compared with healthy individuals. So this is an area to look out for. Um, and subhanAllah, it's actually absolutely amazing that we are dependent on these tiny invisible little creatures to help us be, you know, be healthy. And I think it just reminds us that we are not just solitary individuals. We are not just the king uh, of the universe and, you know, the oppressors in the system, that we are highly interdependent creatures on everything in this ecosystem, including these tiny, tiny bacteria that we see are so almost in a sense you know they're invisible to the naked eye um, and then the link between the gut microbiome and mental health so the Belgian Flemish gut flora project actually showed that having um, people with depression have a narrow range of uh, gut microbes um, and also these people will report a lower quality of life so in this slide I've just captured that there's a huge variety of bacteria and that th their volumes and their species vary depending on where you are in the gut and this is an area that we're still understanding. However, the key principles here are diversity, um, large numbers and adaptability. So they have to adapt with us through our lifestyles, uh, through our life cycle, through our age. Um, people that are more likely to age early have a narrow range of gut bacteria gut bacteria affected by things like stress, which is almost ubiquitous in our generation. Um, but also if you're taking supplements or you're taking yogurts, sometimes they may only have a small numbers um, of gut bacteria or maybe destroyed by the stomach acid. So the best way is probably to introduce these through your foods. So these are some foods that you can use to support a healthy microbiome. Um, first I'm talking about prebiotics, so this is feeding the healthy gut bacteria um, and there are some really common examples here like garlic, onion and leeks, um, whole grains such as oats and barley, high fibre fruits, particularly unripe bananas, dark chocolates, wild rice and quinoa. These are great sources of prebiotics. What are prebiotics? Prebiotics are certain three groups of chemicals such as the beta-glucans and arabinogalactosans that are found in certain types of complex carbohydrates and high fibre foods. Um, and we've got examples of these being included in the Sunnah diet of the Prophet Sallallahu So the Prophet Sallallahu used to eat goldina, which is a barley-based porridge. And of course, this is not hulled barley, but it's, it's whole grain barley. Um, remember that he had a largely semi-vegetarian diet. So while he said loved fruit, loved uh, meat, um, of course, remember there was no factory farming in those days and there was a huge respect for the animals that were sacrificed to be eaten. And of course, they were probably high in things like omega-3 and B12 because they were grass fed and, and not fed fodder um, and were also tender and looked after. So they didn't have stress hormones going around them, um, which are the things making us sick, I suspect. But also honey, um, cucumbers, the Prophet Sallallahu used to have cucumbers and dates in the hadith in Sahih Muslim. Um, and figs, figs are a good source of prebiotics, really high in fibre and great during fasting. Probiotic foods, these would include various groups, so things such as raw and cultured dairy, so milk, cheese, yoghurt, kefir, um, beverages, um, particularly things like salty, lusty, iftar time, which help to regulate blood sugar and boost hydration. Shal gum is a Turkish drink made from fermented turnips, kombucha, fermented tea and kefir, fermented water. Um, vegetables, anything you can pick up at home really, will be an excellent probiotic food. But sauerkraut and kimchi, which are both made from cabbage, are excellent sources of vitamin C, loads and loads of vitamins, and uh, you know, uh, a fantastic source of probiotics and so easy to make. Um, you've then got um, lacto fermented fruits and chutneys and raw honey. And uh, it's amazing that Prophet Sassan did say in the hadith there was a man that approached him. Um, about his brother having had diarrhea and I believe this hadith is in Sahih Muslim um, and a man came to the Prophet Sallallahu and said my brother has diarrhea the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi said give him honey to drink the man gave him honey to drink and he said his diarrhea only got worse and the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi said Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala has told the truth and your brother's stomach is mistaken he gave him more honey and he got better 
And in fact, now we know that honey is incredibly healing for the gut. It's prebiotic and probiotic. Um, it's a live, living food, subhanAllah. Um, what is the example of the sunnah? So in the sunnah we have nabid, which are lacto-fermented grapes and raisins. So the Prophet ﷺ would steep um, either dates, grapes or raisins with water, cover them um, and have that the next day. Or, or leave it for two or three days, but no longer than that, because once it would start bubbling, it would be turning alcoholic. Um, honey, milk, um, which is described as a complete food. Olives, which are typically pickled in brine, a great source of probiotic foods. Um, and uh, homemade or raw vinegar is again a, a, a living food. Okay, so these are some examples of food for Sahur. Um, you could have a lovely omelette with plenty of, of uh, vegetables. Um, here you've got some sourdough pancakes. While these are not probiotic, they may well be prebiotic depending on the type of flour that you've used. Um, and they will definitely be much higher in fibre than regular pancakes. Um, this is not actually a regular chocolate spread. You can get a sugar-free coconut and hazelnut spread um, with some strawberries on top. So although it looks very decadent, it's probably actually very nutritious. Um, and again, remember that the pancakes can be made with things like buckwheat, um, rye flour. You've got a huge range of things you can use coconut flour to make them. Um, these are seeded crackers. Again, really, really easy to make, full of nutrition, fiber, protein, energy, and uh, you know, a good source of prebiotics. Very simple. Um, get a variety of seeds, mix them all up. Just make sure that you include um, a spoon of psyllium husk and a some form of flaxseed, either milled or whole flaxseed. Mix them up with water, add a pinch of salt and any herbs or flavorings that you want to add if you want to add them. Um, and leave that for an hour or so. After an hour, spread that across a baking sheet and just bake it till it turns crunchy. If you add too much psyllium husk, it will be a little bit chewy, but nevertheless, you can top it with, um, you know, almost anything you want, guacamole, cheese, vegetables, meat, and you've got a very nutritious snack there at Sahur or Iftar time. Um, on top of that, that's homemade kefir cheese. Again, very, very easy. You can take the kefir to make a yogurt or make a homemade yogurt, simply strain it and flavour it with a bit of salt, a bit of garlic, um, or jalapenos, or paprika, or whatever you fancy. Um, and it will be a very lovely spreadable cheese. So you have a live cheese there, you know, and a prebiotic cracker. And then you can add some of your rainbow coloured vegetables on top. Um, and this is full traditional Arabic dish. Again, it's very high in prebiotics, um, you know, because it's full of, full of beans and that's a great source of fibre for you. You want to avoid too many salty foods at Sahur. So you might want to put in something like an avocado smoothie. Um, and again, to, you know, bump up the nutrition, you could add something like coconut water, which is rich in minerals. So you could add some chia seeds and you could add some raw honey. Um, overnight oats, everybody is familiar with those. To get additional nutritional benefit, you could soak them in kefir and leave them out and not in your fridge overnight so that um, the bacteria have a chance to multiply, but it doesn't go off. Um, and then this is a pear and ginger chutney. This is lacto-fermentation. Um, so lacto-fermentation is the first stage of fermentation before you get to the alcoholic stage. And it basically means that um, you use either water or whey um, to, as uh, you know, and you submerge the fruit or vegetables in there. And the uh, in the early stage, there's a limited amount of oxygen, so the process generates lactic acid. But if you leave it there long enough, particularly with starches and fruits, it will turn into alcohol probably after about day three, depending on the ambient temperature. Um, but this is very delicious, nice, nutritious thing to add. You know, if you're replacing ketchup, you know, with your samosas and your kebabs and whatever else. Um, here there's some lacto fermented applesauce, so you could make your traditional applesauce. You don't necessarily need to add sugar because apples have a lot of sugar. Add some cinnamon um, and leave it to ferment for about a day. Um, and this fermentation was brought with whey, whereas the pear and ginger was with brine. Um, and then you can top it up with walnuts and have it with some raw yogurt. Um, and you've got a very nutritious meal there. Um, some hacks for iftar time. Hydration is probably the most important thing, but don't do it all in one go. Have um, fruits and vegetables that are really rich in water, so things like watermelon, cucumber, these are great things to have, and the Prophet Sassan loved them. 
Um, we've already talked about having a rainbow coloured salad, salted pickles, and you know having some salt in your thorough meals is important for hydration. Um, avoid white flowers, rice, and couscous. Go for whole grains. Keep your starchy carbs to below twenty five percent to help regulate blood sugars and to stop you sort of feeling very hungry, but also attacking the, the gut. Um, and you could consider swapping potatoes for root vegetables such as celeriac, which is a particularly good choice for chips. Celeriac is a very low carb um, root vegetable, so it works works beautifully, but it's also a fantastic source of fiber and prebiotics. Whereas potatoes are considered an anti-nutrient, so they stop you absorbing nutrients. Um, here we go, lots of examples of rainbow colored foods. You can add in some olive oil on top of your salad, so when you add the fat to your vegetables, it boosts the absorption of fat-soluble vitamins. It's a fantastic combination. Um, and here you've got some kimchi, again, very, very easy to make. Um, salt your cabbage leaves, shred them, um, and then, you know, uh, you would mix in a garlic, ginger, and chilli paste, um, and then you would basically rub the paste on the cabbage, um, and press it into a jar. If you need to top it up with some brine and leave it there, you can leave it for a minimum of 24 hours or a few more days if you like a stronger taste. Essentially there's next to no sugar in there so it won't produce an alcohol but it will produce lots of lacto-fermentation. If you leave it long enough it will taste of vinegar um, but it will still be uh, very very tasty. This is Nabith so this is the um, you know the so soaked raisins in this case. Um, just some healthy protein here that you might want to have alongside all these plant-based meals so tandoori chicken um, and uh, your traditional lassi so inshallah i hope that's helpful for everyone um and uh inshallah wish you good health during ramadan